So kia ora koutou katoa. We'll just let some time for people to trick in as you're coming through. And just as people are coming through, we just want to let everyone know that for this presentation, we are we do have a transcribing service so people can access the transcribing service through here. Let me put it into the chat. Okay, so we've got a few people coming through and I reckon we can get started with a karakia and then some introductions. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā tara tara ki tai, e hi ake ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, tihei mauri ora. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa, ko Miriam Sessa ahau. Firstly, I'd like to start by acknowledging our tangata whenua and tipuna in Aotearoa, the mana whenua of where we're broadcasting from, as well as the land that you are joining us from. Uh, just before we fully get into um, introductions, we'll just do our usual housekeeping for our online learning and online webinars, just so you can orientate yourself in this space. Um, there is a... Uh, Q&A function at the bottom, as well as a chat function. So as you're floating in, please type into the chat who you are and where you're from. This panel discussion is going to be quite interactive. Um, so do feel free to pop in questions as we go. If you don't click at the top of the chat to everyone, it will only come to us as panelists. So if you want to let everyone know who you are and where you're from, make sure you click everyone. So. As many of our webinars are about sexual violence, we just like to remind people that um, to check in with yourself, to, um, to pay attention to how you're feeling and what's going on, and a reminder that there is support out there for anyone who might need it. Um, we normally put the Safe to Talk website up there, but you might have people in your um, supervisors and friends that you can connect in with. So we're going to do a bit of a round of introductions um, so that you know who's online with us. Um, and I will start off because um, I don't often get to introduce myself, but I, today I'm part panellist, part host. So we'll be interacting and engaging. So um, as I said, my name is Miriam. I um, am the previous Toei Caucus um, manager and have um, just recently stepped down. I've been working in this area for um, a while, mostly in all, for all of um, my time I've been working in this area, it's been in the NGO sector, so that's really where my heart is. So I'll hand over to Jala to introduce yourself. Kia ora, my name's Jala. I am a sexual violence advisor for Tauru Caucus at Tor Nest. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I also am a PhD student uh, at Victoria University of Wellington, researching in the area of sexual violence and young people as well, um, and kind of have varying kinds of mahi across the sexual violence prevention sector. Um, and I'm looking forward to today. It's going to be heaps of fun. My pastor, Lily. Kia ora. Um, I'm Lily K. Ross. I um, was born in the US and came out to Aotearoa, New Zealand to do my PhD in gender studies, looking at social responses to sexual violence. And um, during um, a large swath of, of um, when these rapid assessments were being uh, getting off the ground, I was a sexual violence advisor with Toa Nest Tauiwi Caucus. And over to you, Hella. I too was uh, working uh, for Tornes Toi Caucus at the time, um, this time last year, really. Uh, my background is in, I have experience in the sexual and domestic violence sector, um, but more recently uh, looking at the intersection between that work and uh, workplace equality, uh, also formerly known as diversity, inclusion, equity. Uh, I hail from Tamaki via Egypt, Tamaki Makoto, that is, um, but I am zooming in from Wurundjeri land here in Nam, also known Melbourne. Um, and I just want to quickly pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging uh, and extend that respect to any Māori watching this webinar today. 
Kia ora, hello. So the structure of today is a little bit different from our usual webinars in the sense we will be going through a PowerPoint, um, but but we really would like to interact and engage with you. So please use the chat as much as possible. Um, this webinar is being recorded. The slides will be um, sent to you via email afterwards, as well as the actual report on what we're presenting on today. So Jala, do you want to um, lead us through the next part? Sure. So I am going to share my screen and just pop up a PowerPoint. Let's hope that it works. Can you all see that? Yes. Great. And just also for context, before we get started, I forgot to introduce Teresa Murray, who is our transcriber for today. And um, we have her on screen to be able to look at her facials in case we speed up. Um, so we're going to be intentionally trying to keep our pace slow so she can transcribe um, so that this is an inclusive webinar for today. Kia ora. So just a bit of context of why the four of us are here today is that over um, since the start of the pandemic in 20, March 2020 till now, um, Toei Caucus has had a range of workers, including us four, who um, were pivotal in starting um, the process of collecting regularly data from the from the frontline services um, for advocacy purposes. And as um, at the time I was the Toe Caucus Manager, my biggest leadership tip for anyone across the country is hire very smart people, give them a great container and direction, and then get out of their way and let them do some fabulous work, which is my why I'm absolutely delighted to be in a panel with these, um, with uh, the three of you. So thank you, thank you for the great work that you've done. Awesome. So we uh, we have a loose structure of kind of taking you all through the journey of our rapid assessment, data collection, and writing up the report. And so we're going to start with a bit of an overview of the Whakapapa of rapid assessments themselves, um, as well as how we came to choose to use this method of data collection during the pandemic. And I'm going to pass over to Hala to kick us off. Kia ora. So um, obviously the rapid assessment briefing goes into way more detail, um, but I wanted to quickly cover off um, why rapid assessments came about um, and what, what even are they and why are they so important? And I do invite the other panelists um, to chip in um, whenever you like. Uh, so in terms of uh, some background, uh, national and local sexual violence services came together uh, really early on in the pandemic, uh, towards the end of March 2020, to share information, resources, um, and to kind of help us to navigate the challenges posed by COVID-19. Uh, really early on, there was this acute awareness, uh, and I guess that was influenced by our experiences um, post-earthquake uh, in Christchurch, um, and an acute awareness that emergencies impact sexual violence and domestic violence. Yeah, so we had the sense that we needed to work together collectively um, to put this at the forefront of government policy. To do this um, advocacy, we really needed to be able to tell a cohesive story, um, one that encourages responsive and not reactive government policy yeah so at to uh Tawanes Tawiri caucus um we suggested uh, we implement rapid assessments as a means for collecting data um that data was really needed for be for being able to tell that collective storytelling so uh what are rapid assessments uh and sorry i'm not really speaking directly to the slides but um this is of re relevance obviously um Rapid assessments are a global best practice for evidence-based emergency planning and response. Uh, they're really very commonly used at the beginning and throughout an emergency um, to kind of get a sense or a lay of the land. Uh, so first and foremost, they're a data collection tool. Uh, they help give you a snapshot of what's happening, pressing needs, um, barriers to service provision, uh, and I think most importantly, gives a voice to affected populations. Uh, really important to note, though, that 
Uh, rapid assessments are a tool implemented by pr practitioners, not researchers and not academics. Yeah, they don't, uh, they, they're not intended to create statistically significant uh, data sets um, and they cannot replace uh, robust research. Yeah. Um, anyway, Toanes Toiwi Caucus, uh, we used RAs or rapid assessments uh, uh, with sexual violence uh, frontline agencies to create this snapshot. Um, to look at trends and barriers to service provision and survivors' experiences. And really this helped to inform the collective storytelling uh, and advocacy to government, especially in relation to resource allocation. Um, so I guess what I, um, I, I, just a couple of things I wanted to bring up and I would love to hear other people's thoughts on this, um, is that like how important is data um, I think like often data collection is seen as like super clunky and not very sexy. Um, but what we've learned, I think, is that it's entirely important if we want to be responsive to the actual needs of the survivors in the sector, um, especially in times of crisis. Um, so, you know, in our workforce, we need to think about building that capacity to collect and analyze data quickly as integral to service provision, but not just in terms of advocacy as well. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I was thinking of saying that is, um, I think especially sometimes at the front line, um, there, there's a mix, there's mixed emotions around data collection. There's some people that um, feel that it can get in the way of engaging directly with our clients. And I think this, the way we developed it was really thinking about the busy practitioner on the front line, the busy service manager on the front line. We, and we put a lot of thought into that um, because, and thanks to your expertise, Hella, as well, of guiding us through what rapid assessments are for and thinking that they're a tool for us to hear and respond and adapt. Um, and that I think was really useful. Um, and I think it actually, at least for, for me from working in a peak body national office, it actually built a lot closer relationship to what is happening regularly um, for our frontline services. So it had a um, it had a real relationship capacity. Um, and I know that there's lots of people online who have been filling out those forms over the last year. So let us know also what it was like for you to fill out these um, these forms regularly with us. And I'm wondering if um, Lily and Jala have anything to add. Yeah, I would just building on your comments around relationships. I think that's a really key point. Um, it's something we've all discussed as a ropu, that this couldn't have been done without the strong relationships we have with our sector. Um, not only people who kind of understand our intention and are trusting us to hold their, uh, their data and to kind of um, have faith that we uh, I know what we're doing with it, as well as allowing us to kind of gently nudge every month to please fill out the rapid assessments. And so it's a really it's a real nod to how amazing the relationships that we have across the sector mm. are with varying agencies that they have faith in us to be able to carry this out. Mm. And I think tied to that is also hearing the commitment across the board that we're all doing this because at the centre of our practice is our communities and those impacted by sexual violence like that is clear it was really clear from us at national office um, and is really clear from our frontline services on a daily basis so yeah just to jump off um both Miriam and Jala's comments it also really stresses the power of the collective mm -hmm. um and, you know, we, we the success of the rapid assessments in, in terms of influencing government policy is, is there, but, you know, there, there will always be gaps. But um, but I think the way the sector is funded uh, by the government encourages, tries to encourage services to, to compete or to work individually. And um, what we saw with these rapid assessments, um, which were actually part of a broader collective response, um, yeah, that the sector resisted this individualization and this compartmentalization. And I think that's really kind of beautiful as well. Cool. Should we move on to the next slide? 
So, um, I, I, I do have one. Yes, go for it. It just popped up around relationship, which is that you, being able to collect this data in the first place depended on the relationships that Toa Nest has with our member agencies um, as an organization and also the relationships that individuals in different organizations have built over years of working together on this issue. And um, but I think that there was also a way in which the rapid assessments as a, a new tool for our sector to be deploying really helped to build and advance relationships even further. So it was a um, positive feedback loop. But then there's also, you know, when we think of Toa Nest as, as sitting um, as a collective uh, voice of the sexual violence sector that's then advocating to government, I think one of the things that rang really clearly was that in the rapid assessments and in sort of working together around the COVID-19 pandemic response, there was a real strengthening of relationships with government as well. And so it moved in a lot of different directions and um, enabled us to not only get a, um, a picture of what was going on uh, in, in the frontline crisis organizations and by extension of that in our communities, but to also be able to strengthen relationships at sort of a 360 degree um, approach. Should we move to the next slide? Yes. Let's, so I think we have kind of um, discussed this, which was what Hella was talking about in terms of what rep assessments can and cannot do. Um, and I think that, you know, she did a great job of that. Um, and so the next thing that I maybe want to pass on to was just talking about like what our intentions were and just to kind of start providing discussion about what our intentions were so then we can kind of move on to see whether we achieve what we set out to do. Marion, did you want to take that? Yeah, I was thinking um, in those early days uh, of the pandemic in particular, there was, uh, you know, we were exploring international, observing what was happening internationally. And um, in New Zealand, it did occur at a slightly delay. So we did have the opportunity to learn. And I was thinking before we got to the rapid assessments, um, because lots of us also had international relationships. So I was able to connect with um, some colleagues in Italy who were one of the first countries outside of China hit, um, outside of Wuhan in particular hit. And um, I was able to have conversations with some colleagues there. So, And they gave me some really clear advocacy points around um, what would be useful to advocate in the context of sexual and domestic violence response. And that kind of then went, because I had that in mind when Hella so talking about um, this possibility of collecting data regularly, that aligned really strongly with the recommendations that we got from colleagues overseas of ensuring that we could keep track regularly. Um, initially, we were gonna do it just for a short time, but both us and our services, who many of you are online, saw the value in collecting regularly data um, and saw that value of that collective story. And I remember in December 2020, we were suggesting that we were going to have a break for December um, and give everyone a break. And our frontline services said, why? We don't go on holiday. Why should you? <laughs> um, and I think that for me, even though it's a, you know, a cute story, is actually that tells us the commitment um, that our frontline services had um, to this process, that they saw the value. Um, in those early days, another thing that happened was we, um, as Tuana, so we got together with the peak bodies of the family violence sector, and we started to see really early on that we needed an integrated approach with government um, to respond to the pandemic. And thanks to existing relationships, in particular with the Joint Venture Business Unit, um, we were able to create um, these, which still go today, which I think has strengthened that, um, that you know, capacity for us to respond together. And it has actually built a stronger sense of partnership between government. And it's not perfect, and there's still power dynamics, but it's definitely the, like that's probably one of the positive outcomes of this pandemic is that strengthened relationship. I'll hand over to you to all to. Um, in yeah. terms of the um, the kind of global lens on this, uh, I did mention I mentioned that rapid assessments are a kind of global best practice tool. 
Um, but I think just in terms of generally, it's it's good practice to learn uh, uh, from other, you know, other experiences around the world as well. And I think these rapid assessments are a testament to that kind of responsiveness um, to good, you know, international good practices. Um, in terms of like the the sec the family and um, domestic violence and sexual violence sectors coming together um, really replicates that uh, that more general cluster approach and disaster uh, disaster um, response. Um, it would be great in terms of in terms of thinking about what we can do in the future. Um, to think about how we can be uh, more multi-sectoral in our approaches and not just uh, working with the violence, se violence uh, sector, but looking beyond that as well. And just a comment that's come through just now in the chat is um, that, you know, someone who works in government that states that, that they assure us that the rapid assessments have been very well received by government, especially in the face of enormous gaps in data on victim survivors' needs and help-seeking experience. So we have that gap anyway. And then in the context of the pandemic, we were able to track it quite closely and see and start to see trends over time, which I think was really valuable. Yeah, and I um in the terms of the feedback loop that we've been having with the with people who are providing data is, you know, since the last year, we've started to ask questions to our sector about, you know, do you still find this valuable? Is this something you still want to engage with? And like we're kind of overwhelming getting the feeling of like they understand how repetitive some of the answers are, and yet also recognizing the importance of the nature of it being repetitive, because they're explaining mm -hmm the consistency and the pervasiveness of certain issues that the sector is experiencing. And so while the data is certainly repetitive in some areas, that in itself is a really powerful advocacy tool, um, which I think is a really important point. And in terms of talking about, you know, government's um, appreciation for data, we're going to talk about the methodology of the rapid assessments in a moment. And I really want to highlight how powerful the approach that we have used is because we've used both quantitative and qualitative measures. And so we are able to provide certain statistical you know, data that we know is highly valued by those in government while also providing a platform for storytelling and really showing government and our sector and anyone who is reading them the power of individual voices and individual experiences. So talking about methodology, if anyone else, unless anyone else has any more comments on this section, I will hand over to Lily to kind of talk through the methodology. Sure. Um, yes. So, um, so I I came into Toa Nest in August of 2020, and so a lot of the um, the, the methodology for data collection was already in place and then became a matter of tweaking now and again to add new um, new questions, new things we wanted to know about. So by the end of it, we were starting to ask questions about the length of people's waiting list. And then based on the responses, it was clear that length of waiting list could mean the number of people on the waiting list, or it could mean the duration of time that they were on the waiting list. And it was like, well, we actually, I would like both of those. Um, and so it was an evolving process. And yet, you know, I came in and it was already with a very strong foundation. Um, and there was the, um, sort of tick boxes, the things where, you know, Google would give us nice little charts so we could have a sense of there's like a 80% of our people are reporting an increase in the need for uh, long term support or crisis intervention or referrals to other services. Um, and then there was a lot of qualitative stuff. So we were asking about what are some of the barriers and uh, the, and, and what are what's happening with some of our vulnerable populations and the data that we ended up collecting around that really painted a very um, intersectional picture of what was going on and it, it varied from week to week so sometimes it was people with intellectual disabilities who were having trouble um, accessing services 
Uh, sometimes it was related to what was happening on university campuses. Sometimes it was related to uh, migrants and folks who were experiencing higher levels of, of, of violence and seeking support, but then struggling with the immigration system and the delays in the immigration system and what that meant for staying in uh, dangerous situations that were presenting sexual violence risks in, in different ways as a result of the pandemic. Um, children came up a lot. Um, in, a, in a number of different ways where we were seeing a really urgent need for services that have um, the ability to be not just sexual violence specialists, but also to have specialization in working with children and young people. Um, and I think that is an outstanding gap. Um, we have many outstanding gaps. I mean, the housing crisis would come up sometimes. Um, and so, you know, there would be different emerging themes from, from month to month that were um, painting pictures of how different social issues um, and, and different, uh, different demographics and, and groups across New Zealand were experiencing this crisis and how it related to sexual violence in fundamentally different ways. Um, the other thing that I tried to be uh, very attuned to as far as the data collection and the analysis was to, and, and every, you know, everybody else has, on the panel has addressed this, but really attending to those frontline workers and those frontline organizations. So trying to make the um, assessment itself as approachable and um, quick, rapid, <laughs> as far as assessments go for the people who had to fill it out because they had other things on their plate that were immediate and pressing and urgent. Um, and so that was significant. And I think there came a point where, you know, there was the month to month um, generation of rapid assessments that would give an update on the month. And then in, towards the end of 2020, I started working on the 2020 overview piece of work. And what we did for that was, um, Miriam went ahead and actually found the uh, organizations that had been the most consistent in providing us with data month to month. And so we were able to look at those organizations across the span of many months to see what stories we could find within those organizations and what had sort of happened. And I think um, a few things really um, still stand out to me that I still think about months later. Um, one of them was the um, the quite clear feedback loop between what's going on with community needs and how that interfaces with the well-being of our workforce. So, for example, barriers in service provision distresses our workers because they see there's a barrier here. We're not able to meet the community need or inundation. We would have periods of time where our organizations were coming and saying, we are inundated. We are, we cannot keep our head above water. We have way too many people. You know, we can't meet the need. We can't meet the need. We can't hire the staff that we need. Um, that had a significant impact on the well-being of our workforce. Um, and then in the other direction, the decisions that were being made about policy and resourcing. So there was a period early in the pandemic where there was a lot of flexible funding within high trust arrangements. And this was spoken of very highly by our frontline organizations. Um, but as the pandemic wore on, there was um, a real, I think in the data, you know, there, there was there was this uh, cry from certain agencies of like, we don't have the people, we can't meet the need, and, and we're we're feeling we're feeling this. And I think um, I pulled up a, a a quote here from Sarah Ahmed's Living a Feminist Life. I wanted to pull from on resilience because I think it I think it's I think it's important to to both celebrate the resilience and the commitment and the dedication of our workforce in this sector while also acknowledging that we shouldn't have to be resilient um, that there's structural things that can be done to um to, to strengthen our organizations and to strengthen our communities so that it's not up to individual workers to feel resilient so um and, and to enact resilience so sarah ahmed says if the twig was a stronger twig, if the twig was more resilient, it would take more pressure before it snapped. We can see how resilience is a technology of will or even functions as a command. 
Be willing to bear more. Be stronger so you can bear more. We can understand too how resilience becomes a deeply conservative technique, one especially well suited to governance. You encourage bodies to strengthen so they will not succumb to pressure, so they can keep taking it, so they can take more of it. Resilience is a requirement to take more pressure, such that the pressure can be gradually increased. And I think what I really heard in the rapid assessments across the year and then in, in you know, beginning to draft the 2020 overview, which really was a team effort, um, was that uh, that that how do we alleviate that pressure? How do we take it off the backs of our workforces and instead build more robust systems and structures and workforces that are able to um, both meet the community need and support workforce well-being? I think so that just to um, jump off that um, burnout was a thing in our sector long before the pandemic. Uh, and I think that I think like it's so great that you've brought that up um, because any good emergency planning um, in response needs to be thinking about the context before emergencies even happen. Um, so in the disaster response world, we call that emergency preparedness. And what the data showed was that the sector wasn't prepared in some ways because of a consistent lack of investment in not just the workforce, but in terms of uh, well, workforce development and planning and so on, but in terms of having a, a overarching national plan around prevention and response. Uh, and of course, it's more recently with the government's in, invested in a multi-billion dollar uh what is it billion or million <laughs> can't keep up a lot of money is being invested into the sector now but um that should have happened a long time ago um mm. so yeah thank you for bringing that up lily and i think it ties in um there's just a, a couple of comments that have come through and one person <clears throat> saying that they totally agree with you hella um but also the I think what you were saying and what we were saying before about the power of the collective voice um, and whether it was specific um, to workforce or um, experience on the frontline experiences of our communities is um, what someone's commenting in the chat is that it actually gave us something to stand on in terms of a valuable narrative um, well, a, a real narrative and a and an immediate narrative month by month to be able to advocate to government, um, and that for me was the most powerful piece of this journey was um, actually and also having government requesting it and asking for it month by month, going, "Hey, when's that data coming?" Because they were finding it also useful um, to kind of figure out and absolutely a, a, um, echo that sentiment of. We, as a sector, um, collectively and historically and together with our, our um, tangata whenua and diverse community partners, we've been advocating for these needs for decades. Um, and so that's the, for me, this pandemic has just highlighted some massive, not just gaps, but systemic policies that have failed communities um, up until now and so that's what we need to respond and I found actually the when we were going through this that the con the information that we actually had from international humanitarian responses around you know preparedness and just was absent in some of our spaces and I found that very early on that the fact that actually we didn't have someone from with our level of specialization thinking about the safety and well-being of children women or anyone who could be at risk from domestic and sexual violence that weren't central to some of the pandemic planning. That for me is one of the, and even to date, I think it took in the last lockdown, the Prime Minister, I, th I think I counted 14 days before she mentioned anything about safe bubbles and that people could leave with when they weren't safe in their bubbles. So there's something still that we're not getting right. Um, around um, emergency response and I and our hope is that this will hopefully help raise the profile and the need yeah just to add to that I think in terms of actions uh 
that, you know, in terms of moving forward, I think the rapid assessments um, show how important it is for the government to be investing in research more broadly, um, you know, fund PhDs, fund research, fund research bodies. Um, we need to have a centralised sexual violence and family violence research centre that, you know, systematically collects data. Um, but another thing is that also we need the government to be funding services to collect this data. Um, you know, again, we have an overworked, under-resourced, albeit amazing and totally essential workforce, you know, invest in them, um, invest in these services to build that capacity um, and, to, you know, to have the time and the energy to be able to do that, that work as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I just also wanted to mention, um, just having also conducted these rep assessments this year um, and looking at comparatively um, with last year and the, the different lockdowns, as we are seeing from our services, they're saying, you know, this lockdown, we were much more prepared. However, their kind of messaging is that we're prepared because we experienced it and we have the mechanisms and the experience in place to handle the next one. However, they're not saying we're more prepared because we're getting better support systems from government. So it's, a, it's really, they're saying their preparedness for this one is not because of any external support, it's because of their, their own selves. And again, again, that resilience building, it's happened over time. And so I think that's a really key point. It's like we need to be learning and being prepared for what is inevitably going to be this or another you know, crisis at some point. And it needs to not just be within internal organizations, but with that solid infrastructure. Um, does anyone else want to add anything else before we move One on to the themes? Um, just mm -hmm. the, the concept of emergencies in general. Um, I think the term shadow pandemic has become quite common. Um, in the sector, we've had a, a, in New Zealand, we have a crisis, ongoing crisis around sexual and domestic violence. Our rates are through the roof. Um, we have some of the highest rates in the OECD, completely unacceptable for such a small country like ours. Um, and so, you know, it's not just waiting for these big emergencies like, you know, COVID-19 or earthquakes and so on, but, you know, recognising that the crisis and the emergency has long been here. Um, yeah. Just one thought too, and I think we've sort of nodded to this, but, but the notion of emergency, I think, is one that will continue to have an evolving meaning over the course of our lifespans. And so we have the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which is continuing to be a, an emergent situation and will remain such indefinitely. And then on top of that, we have climate catastrophe and serious, you know, issues with inequality. And like, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be facing a lot more crises and a lot more emergencies over the next couple of decades. And so the more that we can do to be um, building out that preparedness plan, building out that capacity, allocating resources appropriately, and really to the best of our ability, I think, um, strengthening our communities, not just our, our sector, our services, our specialists, but strengthening our, our communities um, to be able to, um, yeah, try to ch try to prevent some of this as, I mean, we want to be preventing it in the best of times, right? But but I think we, we aren't going to be living in the best of times <laughs> over the next couple of decades. And so, um, yeah, just wanted to nod to that as well. And I think and that idea that you mentioned around um, the conceptualizations of emergencies uh, is really key because I think in order to prevent or better respond to what we consider to be those big crises, climate crisis, COVID-19, that kind of thing, we need to have better responses for what I would, you know, local crises. So the housing crisis, for example, because as you said, there was a repeated theme almost every month in the rapid assessments around housing issues. And so if we had a bidding housing response, you know, when it came to things like the climate crisis, we would, people would, communities would be st strengthened to be able to handle that. Um, and so 
the fact that these issues are currently siloed out um, and treated as separate means that we are failing to respond adequately to any of them. And so if we treated things like sexual violence, things like housing, things like pay inequities as with the extent to which they deserve now, we would not be in these situations later on down the track. Anyway, so we're going to move on to discuss the themes that came out of the rapid assessment. So as you can see here, we kind of conducted uh, an analysis of certain th themes and trends that emerged from the collective data. And then we also constructed those six case studies that Lily mentioned um, based on the stories of six particular agencies who had really high response rates. So um, I'm just going to remind us all to slow our pace down. Sure, thank you. Um, and so th these are the five trends that came out of our kind of collective analysis of everyone's um, response, looking at these as being the biggest themes and trends that came out of the sexual violence sector during the pandemic. Would anyone like to start off by speaking to any of these? Okay, well, I'm going to invite Miriam to start. Cool. Um, I, I think, <clears throat> I think um, definitely, I don't think any of these actually surprised us. To be fair, um, they. I think over the over the year, we definitely found some surprising sub themes of like the increased. Uh, I think I remember one month. It was really interesting that we had multiple services all talk about the elderly reaching out for help and it was just after the first level four national level four lockdown as though and so there was some really interesting sub themes that came out um and definitely um the increased risk of child sexual abuse and help seeking with um also adults so we were seeing both adolescents and quite young children needing help at different times and they're really i mean i'm just gonna get on my child need for um child sexual violence crisis services and better support for children across the country um, because that really highlighted an existing gap um, of inconsistent support around that. So, and the limited access to service, uh, we've already discussed this, but it really touched on existing inequalities in our society. So um, in that first level four lockdown, you know, hearing how much our frontline services were struggling to, um, you know, be able to access, for people to be able to access the support they needed to be able to cope with the lockdown, as well as with their experiences of um, violence and sexual violence. We started also finding different advocacy pieces. So we were able to get some phones from Spark and some vouchers from Uber um, to be able to actually support some of this limited access. So again, it it just highlighted the existing um, inequalities and existing um, struggles that our services have to reach out um, to the people that we need to reach out to. Anyone yeah, else? Yeah, and I think in terms of the, like, so the theme around compounding pre-existing vulnerabilities and disparities, this was incredibly pressing. And I think we were you know, lucky to get these stories that just highlighted the extent to which this was an issue. So it wasn't, you know, um, agencies just saying we're seeing people experiencing multiple types of stress, but there were these really rich and detailed stories of survivors trying to access services or um, trying to navigate the system, but having to deal with barrier after barrier after barrier and highlighting again those intersections between the different issues. So, you know, we were seeing issues around housing and pay and employment and mental health particularly all come together. Um, and we were also interestingly seeing a lot of stuff around physical and mental health needs um, to do with the types of harm that were differing in relation to outside of the pandemic. So again, just those pre-existing vulnerabilities is something that I think as a term that we use a lot, but I really want to kind of bring the people into that term and humanize how important that theme is because, you know, we're currently not providing adequate structures and support for people who are experiencing multiple types of stress. And yet this is the lived reality for most people who seek services and seek help. 
Yeah, and that really speaks to why a multi-sectoral response is so important. Um, like compartmentalizing, um, without, no, no human is compartmentalized. You know, you don't worry about housing versus this versus that. Everything is, is interconnected. So that's, that really speaks to that. And I think the increase in help seeking, um, uh, and I know we've had, I mean, the beauty of actually these rapid assessments is they never sat in isolation. It was, um, you know, there was the rapid assessments alongside our regular meetings with people from the front line who most likely were also filling out those um, rapid assessments. And just thinking about that increase in help seeking that we're seeing, which is connected to some level, you know, we've had a significant amount of years of Me Too movement of, that has increased um you know, the the, dial, the collective dialogue as well as, you know, actually people needing to, wanting to seek help as well as the current Royal Commission of Inquiry into State Abuse Care here in Aotearoa, um, as well as now um, the impact of COVID. So I, I think that increase of need, um, we're in a quite a critical point where we, I think collectively as a sector, we also need to start thinking um, a little bit outside the box of how do we deliver services because our wait lists are telling us a story that even with even if we are able to recruit all of the frontline workers we need we still not might we still might not be able to fully meet demand so how else can people get support and I think this is um, this is beyond COVID in some ways um, as well as compounded by COVID but just thinking about that the models of how and the theories that we think about help for people and individuals, what are their limitations? What are, where are they actually working really well? And how else can we offer support to our communities? Um, it's just what's been brewing on my mind um, as we've gone through these months. Awesome. Thank you for that. And I think we're going to move on to talking about the case studies because they particularly highlight issues around workforce, which I know is something that we're all quite passionate about mm -hmm. and probably will want to chat about. So, um, here we go. Nope. There we go. So again, those six case studies came out of agencies, six different agencies, and these were the stories that were told over the year long period about the issues that their workforce and their agency was facing um, and we've kind of touched on all of these in some ways but I would like to invite you as panelists to kind of expand on any of these if you'd like. I might start just with number two because I think that's the least obvious in some ways um, and I think uh, from memory of the service that did um, so from memory of the context, there are a few services um, across the country that it's a sexual, specialist sexual violence service within the context of a generalist service. And often, and um, from conversations, that, not just with that service, but across the board in that context, um, sometimes there's this perception that um, our specialist sexual violence response, which includes trauma-informed practice, includes a certain attentiveness to the needs um, and, you know, attentiveness and uh, responsibility and commitment to the needs of survivors is felt as precious or and then is devalued. Um, and so that's what the context of that number two was um, uh, in that kind of, it's probably the the least obvious, um, but that I think is really interesting because it replicates a, a macro dynamic or a, a broader system dynamic of like often in our, in our specialist services, we really, we try and get it and not everyone's perfect and we have a lot of diversity amongst our services, but we get that philosophical stance of advocating and coming from that place of justice for survivors and for those impacted by sexual violence more broadly, including those who are harmful, violent and abusive, um, that we're just kind of, you know, we're, we've got that orientation. When we then encounter um, like the broader dominant stories of uh, of like of our society towards survivors and our workforce is encountering that within the context of the workplace, it creates some quite um, unsupported dynamics, I think is what that number two is about. I just wanted to speak to the um, 
increase in complex referrals. Um, and this, this worries me in a bigger context in terms of this kind of perception where, okay, you need more staff, just here's some money, go hire some staff. And um, as, as we know in the sector, it's really hard to find and recruit staff. Um, and, and part of that problem is the, and we've spoken about this before, sorry about the soapbox, but um, the kind of consistent uh, ongoing underinvestment in workforce planning and development. Um, and I guess what I want to say, you know, speak to in terms of the increase in complex referrals is that you need to, to be able to manage, case manage complex referrals is quite a, um, it's, it's an expertise, it's a specialization built over years of experience. Um, and it's not something that can just be switched on. You know, you, you can't walk into a sexual violence agency and get a seven day induction and become a, you know, experienced case manager. There's a lot of work uh, that goes into um, becoming, uh, you know, developing those skills over time. And, and again, that comes back to the idea that we need to actually uh, think about emergency response as uh, way beyond an emergency even an emergency even happens, um, bearing in mind that I don't ascribe to this concept of an emergency. I mean, I think we're already pre-pandemic, we're in an emergency when it came to sexual and family violence. But yeah, um, really want to just talk with the fact that the skill set that goes into case managing complex or even just um, non-complex referrals is highly specialized and um, yeah. And I think that, you know, the importance about recognizing speciality in that area means that to develop those years of experience, it's difficult when we are not able to pay our workers to the same extent that ministry agencies can pay their workers. And so there's massive, you know, pay inequities across these different spaces. And so the NGO sector and the sexual violence sector is losing workers and unable to retain them simply because we cannot pay them the same amount. And so in order to retain workers to, to gain that experience that we can see is so crucial, we need to be able to pay them better. And Jala, just to add to that, I just, I would argue as well that it's completely not just unsustainable but unethical for you know government to not be introducing uh you know uh standard pay rates or um specifically moving away from casualization and mandating that um it's not services not wanting to pay staff and to have them on permanent contracts it's it's the lack of ability to do that because of the way they're funded um, so yeah, just casualized, casualized contracts are just completely, uh, d just don't match up to what um, skill, the level of skills and training that goes into building a workforce. Lily, um, I know you've got a lot really delved into that area of workforce when you're working with us and doing these rapid assessments. I'm wondering if you have anything to add. Yeah, I think one of the things I think about a lot in and I, th I think it's an issue that existed before COVID-19 I think it's something that, that is very present in the data that we were looking at and it relates to a lot of these points but I think especially one three and four which is that um you know when there when the workforce is overloaded and there's chronic understaffing and we want to build out the workforce and we recognize there's a need for pay parity between nonprofit and the government space um, there's also the recognition that as, as Hella was talking about with like the skill set required to be managing complex referrals and the time it takes to develop that. I think there's something to be said for also recognizing that not everybody is suited to do this work and not everybody is capable of doing this work to a high standard um, of care and with a robust ethical foundation. And so I think, um, you know, that comes to bear not just in the way that we may provide services for the people in our communities who are coming to our, our services for support, but also comes to bear on this first point, which is um, underlying organizational issues. And so um, just thinking about the, the work of relationships within our workforces and within our organizations and across our sector um, to really be thinking about how do we how do we make sure 
moving forward that um, that when we are growing capacity and we are doing workforce development and everything else, that we're doing that in a way that, of course, equips people to do this work and to do it well, but also creates barriers that ensure that people who should not be doing this work are not doing this work. Um, that benefits our communities, that benefits our workforces, um, but also some of the underlying organizational issues, you know, in some instances it had more interpersonal rings to it or, or um, potentially issues with management, but in other cases it was just maybe a sexual violence organization is within the subset of, of other service services that are being mm -hmm. provided and within the larger umbrella organization this issue of devaluing survivor support really comes to bear and so there's all kinds of wonky or you know uh, dynamics within the organization that are coming about in part because um, you know, people have different opinions about um, mm. victims of violence, survivors of violence, um, and the people who are interested in helping them, and and things like that. So these, all of these points, it's like it's so. I love seeing this like wonderful, like boom, boom. Here's you know all these these key ideas and the ways that they are just utterly woven together mm -hmm. um, and tell us like there's there's just such vivid and complex stories. Um, I hope the people who are listening today will have a chance to at least skim the um, 2020 rapid assessment briefing because you know that's the point where where we were able to very um, succinctly summarize some of the stories of what was happening on the ground in these different agencies that really helped us to hone in on some of these issues and understand like these these feedback loops. There were so many interesting feedback loops going on. Um, and so I think there's just there's so much that we can still be learning, I think, from from uh, not just this piece of work, but the the work that that Toa Nest and the sexual violence sector has undertaken since the start of the pandemic to be collecting and interpreting and telling stories with this data. Yeah, and I, I'm just mindful of we've got five ish minutes left and just wanted to um, really acknowledge those in the room um, who I, I can see their names and I know who they are that that process of knowing how important it is to hold the workers, the workplace, to be able to then hold the support, to be able to support those from the community seeking help um, that have been impacted from sexual violence and knowing how it, how much it takes to transition someone from, you know, a new worker in this field to that experience and that it's a journey and it's a journey that needs to be done really well. And so kind of taking that wisdom that exists in the currently exists from people that we from those organizations doing quite a good job and how do we replicate that across um, as we move to the next slide I'm just going to also put in a feedback form for people to fill out um, just to give us some feedback while we're going through the last session and maybe we can use the last um, the next slide to just kind of think about um, yeah like wrapping up of what is what has it been like for us to go on this journey together with the sector to hearing their voices monthly um, and presenting that to also one piece of information probably we didn't contextualize is every month this information would be collated by government to be presented to cabinet so it actually did get escalated quite high so it was quite a direct voice to those um decision makers that would regularly meet around um, COVID-19 matters. But what were your key learnings? So something that I would like to just uh, kind of contextualize the quote that's on the screen um, is just, it was talking about how our workforce is the canary in the coal mine. You know, our, we are able to view our workforce and, and to understand their experiences as indicative of the wider issue. And they're the ones who are going to highlight what is wrong, if is wrong, points of weakness, points of strength. And something I really wanted to quickly kind of cover is how in our rapid assessments, we would get these stories of our workforces, our workforce going above and beyond. You know, these stories of working outside of hours, unpaid hours, putting themselves in, in different situations um, with these massive workloads in order to support their clients. And these were every month for the past 18 months. Um, and 
what that's really important is because it was linked with people also reporting um, these high workloads, these above and beyond stories, and trying to simultaneously present stories that say they're uh, they're overworked, they're you know under resourced, and yet they're still doing their jobs. And it was this, and yet they're still supporting their clients and doing their best work. And there was this real need for reassurance that despite all these barriers, our workforce were still doing the best they could way outside their scope of practice. And so really emphasizing that while our workers are facing these barriers and are overcoming them, they shouldn't have to be. And I think that was one of the key messages we got around our workforce is that they are doing all these things, but they shouldn't have to be. And it's up to government and our sector and our infrastructures to find ways to kind of alleviate that burden. Yeah, I just want to give a shout out because I I'm operating on the assumption that a good number of the folks listening are people who were filling out forms or working on front lines and like golly, like in some ways, I hope that this webinar and and these um, rapid assessment documents are like they're a celebration of you and the work that you're doing. Um, so thank you very much. Just to jump off that, Lily, um, the. The rapid assessments do come across as quite a technical tool and we've talked about how they've been used to advocate and influence you know straight into cabinet um but for many of us um one they're a celebration of um folks doing the frontline work um but also um you know it's more than that it's a for me really i i view rapid assessments as a um a tool for movement building um and what we've seen is we are stronger together um, and a, a collective response is best practice and I think like it, this is really a testament to relationships the existing ones new ones future ones um we're all in this together and thank you so much for the time and energy you've put into um filling them out and being here today so and someone um in the chat uh, responding to Lily probably I'm um, saying yes the forms were uh, annoying but brief so manageable and I'm glad to, that they have been done and uh, for, for me in that experience I, I felt really and we talked about it at the beginning but felt really honoured to be able to hold those stories and elevate them to really to the highest level, level that we could um, and you know be able to also present them in a really comprehensive report and really um, felt that you know, working alongside all three of you was um, really, really, um, a really important part of this process was also our collaborative approach of, you know, using our multiple expertise um, and different lenses and different, um, different levels of knowledge to be able to tell this really important story. So, um, yeah, is there any final words from any of us to um, wrap things up before we end today? Just a thank you uh, to everyone who mm. has been patient with us and engages with us. There's a saying in movement building that you move at the pace of trust. Um, and I think these are really evident that you have trusted us to help move forward. Yes, I think that's a beautiful way to end. And I think um, I want to personally thank all three of you. Um, you have exceptional people to work for um, and work with and thank everyone online and we'll close with a karakia to wrap up and wish everyone a really lovely weekend unihia 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 ki te uru tapu nui kia wātea kia māma te nāko te tinana te wairo i te ara takata ko ia rā e rongo e whakairia ke ki runga kia tīna tīna Uye taikie. Go well, everyone, and have a wonderful weekend.